Thank you. There are handouts available on this lecture. My own notes on my own lecture, so you don't have to scribble like crazy um, while I'm talking, but you're welcome to if you'd like to. Um, and there are some others, uh, these are the titles of other handouts that are available on our website. And once again, I'll give you the address. And check back every now and then, I am always uh, adding new handouts. There are a number of more topics I would like to cover. Um, and if anyone is truly bilingual and would like to take some of the handouts that are available only in English on the download page, these are available on the Spanish page. But I have others that are available only in English, and if you, if you contact me, uh, I, will ask, I will send you the original um, work uh, Microsoft Word edition, and you, if you want to do the translations for me, great, and we will use them and post them. Thank you. So, what I'm hoping to do today is to give you some tools to help you manage uh, or prevent some of these common behavior problems in Prader Willi syndrome. Uh, Non-compliance, uh, uh, oppositionality, uh, disruptive behaviors, crying, screaming, tantrums in general. And I'll say a few words about uh, conflicts with siblings. Uh, I hope that's one of the handouts I hope to develop in more detail. Okay, so this was a question my mother asked me. ¿Cómo puedo saber que es su espíritu de fe? ¿Cómo puedo saber que no es solo un gánster de seis años? I hear this question in one form or another all the time. How do I know? It's, it's, how do I know? Is it SPW, uh, SPW or not? I answer that question. So what you're doing with these skills, with the simple answer is it doesn't matter, okay? If he's, uh, if he's a gangster or not, <laughs> uh, you will manage it the same. So you no longer have to worry about that question. Okay? Whether he's behaving that way out of evil, okay? Or if he's behaving that way because he cannot help it, it doesn't matter. The management is the same. I have seen that this is even true if the question is, is it her psychosis or her choice? And if you manage it the same, the important thing is that you are not going to reinforce the behavior and you are not going to escalate the child or the woman. Okay, so this slide I just put together to illustrate that most of behavior management in Broder Willis syndrome especially, is the prevention of problematic behaviors. So even your your response uh, in a, well, it has, does two things. It can prevent a proper response can prevent escalation. And it can also prevent the recurrence of the behavior. In the most simple way, you can say, all right, if my child is tantruming for a cookie, and I don't give him the cookie, but I stay calm and I don't scold, he won't escalate. But if I don't give him the cookie, he's not going to necessarily try that again. Uh, if I give him the cookie, I will teach him immediately that the way to get a cookie is to have a tantrum, right? That's the simplest scenario. So we like to use pyramids uh, to show priorities, okay? So our behavior management pyramid for people with prior willis syndrome 
What you're doing with this, with all these modalities, is to control the child's internal environment, his internal level of anxiety, which one of our tools is uh, food security, right? So these are the levels. So the environmental support. I to use it. Oh. Yeah. But environmental support uh, is uh, is the schedule, the rules, the food security. Okay, those are things that are going on all the time in the classroom, in the professional residential uh, care centers, or in the home. Um, the second level is what I'm going to talk about today, and this is the maintenance of skills in family members and in professional caregivers. And this, I think, in looking at how group homes run in the USA and elsewhere, this is the hardest part to maintain, is to keep skilled people who understand how to interact with the person with prader willi syndrome. And I think everyone here has someone in your family that doesn't quite understand. Uh, how to interact, and this causes problems. So, for indi certain individuals, do need specific plans. Uh, plans, uh, I think they're called plans of intervention for uh, behavior, um, or uh, behavior plans in English. And we only all of these things should be in place and fairly well done before we're thinking about medication, okay? So even if a person has clear symptoms of a psychiatric disorder, you may have a great deal of difficulty getting things under control if you don't have these other modalities in place. So these lower ones are needed by everyone. and the higher levels are needed by some people. Okay, so by no means do I want you to leave today and say my child must have uh, medication, not at all. Okay, I call this, it's better in English, the behavior beach ball, okay? just because it looks like a beach ball. But I just want to separate these specific skills. They interact with each other, so that when you are doing one, you are often doing the other, another. And I'm going to go through them one by one. These are the skills that I have witnessed be by the very best parents and the very best caregivers, but um, I decided that they needed to be analyzed and broken down into pieces so that they could be taught to other people. Some people do this very naturally. It's the culture of their family. But for other people, it does not come naturally. Okay? And I would count myself in the second group where I had to I realized how important, how effective this is. Uh, and then it came much more naturally. Okay, so the first one is low expressed emotion. This has been studied formally in uh, cases of uh, schizophrenia, and it also appears in the bipolar disorder literature. Um, it's hugely important for people with prader willi syndrome. They are incredibly uh, uh, sensitive. So this is my number one tool. If you can do nothing else, take this one home with you. You're all stressed by intensity of vocal tone or intense emotion that's in the voice, okay? None of us likes to be screamed at, right? No matter by whom, we don't like being screamed at by a spouse or a parent or our children. A customer, <laughs> okay? And it triggers the fear center in the brain called the amygdala. 
This promotes the body to put forth uh, adrenaline, again, triggering that fear response. We have had many ways to express emotion. A facial expression and body language, um, how we choose our words, um, our volume, but most of all, our tone, the tone we use in our voices. Now, I don't know what happens here, but I'm sure it's the same, but in the U.S., parents always say to me, or I ask them, I say, does your child complain that you were yelling at him, gritar? Are you getting it? And they say, oh, it's complaining all the time that we're yelling at him. But we aren't yelling. We never yell at him. Okay? Now, I didn't raise my voice, but I put a lot of inflection into it, and that's what the child hears. It's the inflection. Inflection, emphasis on certain words, and how, even how we just say the name of the child. Hi, Amy. Knows he's in trouble, right? Just say that. Pablo, you have triggered a fear response. Many people don't realize how much tone they put in their voices. So, uh, especially when you have to repeat instructions. Now, I have my own experiment that I do at home with this. My husband is very uh, hard of hearing, okay? So I'm often repeating things to him. I noticed that it is extremely natural to say, it's time for dinner, dear. Nothing happens. Okay. What am I going to say next? If I say, it's time for dinner, dear, sounds weird. Sounds odd. Okay? What's more normal is, I said, it's time for dinner. Okay? Can you hear the tone? Imitating my time for you. <laughs> okay. So I have practiced repeating instructions with the same matter of fact, unexcited tone. And it's, it does sound weird. Um, it does sound odd. Uh, it's what you need to do if you have to repeat instructions to a person. careful of your tone when you um, have to repeat instructions, when you are redirecting the child from bad behavior, from problematic behavior. Um, when the child is escalating, your adrenaline will go up and it will not be your tone unless you make a deliberate effort to keep it calm, okay? And um, when you are annoyed, when you are annoyed, you're more likely to use it too. When you control your own tone, you are in charge of everything. All of the situation. Okay? So remember that one. Use it with your children, all of them. Use it with your spouse. Use it with your boss. Use it with your employees, and you will rule the world. The next task is one that I haven't heard a lot of um, conversation about from the Prana Rudy world, but I am convinced that um, this skill is essential for uh, avoiding a lot of problem behaviors, and again, in both Prana Rudy children and in typical children, and this has helped with switching tasks. The Prana Rudy brain is a slow processor. Even when they have a high intelligence, they need out of time to process. And the older and the, the adults agree with me when I point this out say, oh yes, I need time. I need time. They can only process one thing at a time. So if one parent is talking to the child, the other, the other parent should not jump in. Only one person talk at a time. 
And it is very difficult if they are doing something else and you want them to change to something else, to change tasks, you, um, you have to give them help and you have to give them time. Task switching is something that we do effortlessly, almost effortlessly or effortlessly, so much so that we aren't even aware that we're doing it. In fact, they've done research that shows that when we're doing all this multitasking that we're always doing, okay, we are um, actually rapidly switching, rapidly switching our attention from one thing to another, from one thing to another. Um, with people with Prader-Willi syndrome, we have enormous difficulty with this, um, and as a result, they appear non uh, non. They appear. Many parents will interpret this lack of respect. Um, they are, uh, or they may be irritable because when you try to force them to make this switch too quickly, they get, they do get angry. Hello. So they need time, uh, lots of time. Sometimes that's all they need. Okay. How much time do they need? Uh, sometimes something like eight or ten, eight or ten seconds to respond. So this. You ask someone to turn off the television or turn off the iPad, okay? And then you wait. <laughs> That's how long eight or ten seconds is. It's how long. But I do this all the time with my patients because when they are in the waiting room, they're busy doing something electronic. I come out and I say, okay, I'm ready for you. And the parents are embarrassed. They reach over, stop that, okay? I say, no, fine. And I don't have to say another word, the vast majority make the change, okay? So all they need is time. What happens typically is this, the parent makes another request within one or two seconds and that request is with high expressed emotion. I said, turn that off. Okay. And now you have a screening kit. For sure. All right. I'm going to go through this uh, in, in a bit of detail. You begin with the request in an agreeable tone. And this agreeable tone is necessary even when you do think that they ought to know that it's time to do something. Okay? Forget that. So it's irrelevant. They always lose track of time. We have no sense of time. You've noticed this. Okay? It's this. Okay. Uh, so you make re your request in an agreeable, optimistic tone, like you expect uh, a good response. But wait, seconds. Um, and then don't be surprised if you need to if you need to repeat it. Okay, this is really important. Expect to repeat your, your request after eight or ten seconds. The reason for this is for is your brain. Okay, if you aren't expecting to have to repeat it, you will be annoyed and it will come out in your voice. So just expect that this is what is needed, all right? Um, then um, repeat the question, the one with the exact tone and inflection that you can as much as possible. Again, for most people, this is enough. But some people need more, okay? Especially when a child is doing something that is a preferred activity, something he loves to do, something that he finds extremely engaging. For many children, this is the electronics, okay? 
So when I have a child who's into the electronics, I just say, well, okay, bring your toy into my office. And then I say, show me this game. Looks good, looks interesting. And so the child immediately makes a switch from playing the game to explaining the game to me. So already I've broken his focus in a way that he can tolerate, all right? After he explains the game to me and I show a lot of interest, maybe I ask a few questions, and this only takes two minutes, um, then I say, that's so cool, can you put that away now? And most of them can do it, okay? In the home, you'll probably have more problems, no question, but these are tricks that work and they work well. After the child does what you want him to do, you can praise him enthusiastically if he's done it immediately, maybe a little less enthusiastically uh, if, if not. One thing you don't want to do is comment on the fact that he did not respond immediately or that he was non-compliant, all right? Skip it, don't discuss it, and don't make it an issue. Certainly, you don't want to start into sarcasm or those parent noises that we all make with rhetorical questions like, how many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> so what really happens in real life? So the first thing that may happen is the child appears to um, ignore your request. Why? Because he is completely hyper-focused on what he is doing. And most of the time, the kids will agree that they don't mind the activity that you were asking them to do, okay? They just hate, hate, hate stopping what they're doing. And I go over this with my patients and they say, that's right, okay? And parents are sometimes puzzled because they say, I asked him to go, we're, we tell him we're going swimming now, and he has a major uh, meltdown or, or tantrum, and he loves swimming. Yes, he loves swimming, but he hates turning off his iPad. Okay, so that's what you're dealing with. Now, sometimes the child does escalate immediately, and he starts protesting and complaining and arguing. What's going on here? Again, forget the theory that this is disrespect. Okay, it's not. It, it's still a cognitive executive function issue. But your very reasonable request is actually a source of stress for them. If you watch these kids while they are trying to change their focus, they actually look stressed, sometimes extremely stressed. So, he, for him, if you are making him feel uncomfortable, it's because you want to make him feel uncomfortable. He cannot think of any other reason, and so he reacts with anger. And so if your child has this pattern, I want you to understand it and give him more time. Um, parents do give warnings, you know, five more minutes. Nothing wrong with that, okay? The problem is that in five minutes, he is completely refocused and hyper-focused on what he was doing. So don't get impatient because he ignored your, um, your warning. You actually have to break his focus the same. The warning may make it a little less of a, a shock to him that it's time to change uh, focus. Okay. I've gone through um, the, uh, the steps you take when you especially um, have a child that you know from experience that making having him change focus is extremely difficult. Um, he, uh, and, and so you, from your own experience, you'll know which activities are difficult for him to let go of. And, um, you can, and you have to stop and shift your focus from what you want him to do to what he is doing, okay? And that actually, you'll find, is a little hard. Sometimes you are in such a hurry that you don't stop and look at the child and look at what he's doing. Um, but that is, that is what you have to do, and if you have difficulty doing that, that is what you're asking the child to do. Switch his focus, okay? Use the positive, optimistic tone. Um, be careful of how you uh, word things or use words. And remember that uh, if you start making threats, if you don't hurry up, you'll be late for school. 
If you don't stop that, you're going to lose your electronics. You, all you do is increase this anxiety. I have other ways of managing the behavior. If, if you, uh, if all you do is increase this anxiety when you make threats or, or talk about um, punishments. Other skills. Um, if you are ignored, uh, move in close, put your hand on his shoulder, and stand there. And he knows, okay, she's not going away, right? Again, most of the time, just giving him time, he can do it. Um, it's it's uh, just your presence there uh, tells him that you are not going away. You know what we parents do? Those of you who have typical kids at home, you do it all the time, I'm sure, I did. Um, is uh, you tell your children to do something, then you go back to something that you were doing, and they go, just a minute, just a minute, we will make them. And then, they, and then 20 minutes goes by, and then you remember, now they didn't do what I told them to do, and you're angry, okay? So they, we, ex, we actually teach our children that if they ask for more time or if they delay, then they'll get extra time. So when you're talking to any of your children, move in close and use your body to let them know this really is it. Okay? This is the time, this is when it's going to happen, and I'm not going to go back to, to cooking dinner and tell them it happens. Okay? You have to do it, you, know, you have to do it for your typical kids. We parents, you parents from this generation are being blindsided by the electronics, okay, and, and the distractions. And the children, I think, are suffering too because we are distracted too by our phones and our computers. Okay. Now, if the child starts to um, object or escalate, argue, uh, just ignore the arguments and act as though he said okay. Now, this is a really funny thing to do, but it works. I had a young man who um, I came in to examine him in the uh, examining room and he said, oh, I can't let a woman examine me, okay? And if I had said, well, I have to examine you, I'm the doctor, I would have lost that game, okay? Big loss. Instead, I said to him, what do you do at home? Where are you from? What do you like to do? I just started asking him questions, I chatted him up, and then after a few minutes I said, can I listen to your heart now? Everything comes off, okay? Because we all know they have no modesty anyway. It was all a big phony. <laughs> you set the tone, not the child, okay? Don't let his tone affect your tone. As much as you can, continue to use the happy, upbeat tone, and don't make his his rejections or refusals uh, into an event. Make it like they didn't happen, okay? And you do this by not responding to his arguments. You do this by not letting your tone escalate and skip the warnings and the threats. Okay, now you can see that this next uh, now you can see that this next uh, topic is closely related, okay? And this is how not to argue. I have learned in my practice that parents need very specific instructions on how not to argue, okay? It's very hard for some people not to get into an argument with a child. Um, and uh, it takes, so I'm going to go through this with great detail. Okay, what is arguing? It's point, counterpoint, he makes a point, you make a counterpoint. Um, and um, the problem with arguing is that you validate arguing by responding to his uh, argument. And um, it pulls you, we say, off message, pulls you off message, and you empower the child, not yourself, uh, by ex letting him establish the agenda. Even if you win the argument, you have lost your authority by arguing. Okay? This is true in many situations, not just with proper children. Okay? The hardest part of not arguing is letting some statement that they make, that which is completely ridiculous or easy to review, go by without comment. I like to say to parents, 
You stand there, and this slow, easy pitch comes in, and you know you can hit it out of the park, keep the bat on your shoulder. Okay? I used to coach softball. All right. Arguing sounds like this. Ven a ayudarme a coger la caca del perro en el patio. Siempre recoja la caca, la, la caca del perro. Nunca le preguntas a Jaime. A mí lo hizo las semanas pasadas. Casi nunca tienes que hacerlo. Jaime nunca lo hace. Siempre tengo que hacerlo. Eres tú que quería un perro, tú dijiste, etc. Ok, you get the idea. The parent is escalating, ok? The parent is arguing. So the yellow, the yellow um, balloons show the child makes an argument. He gives a reason why he shouldn't have to do it. No le preguntas a Jaime. And then Jaime, um, and then you, the parent, falls into the trap, okay? This is the trap. He said something that is not true, and the parent tries to point that out, and this is a mistake, okay? And once the parent starts arguing, Okay, once the parent starts arguing, then the child continues to argue, to argue, okay? And now, in the orange, the parent is actually escalating, and now he's escalated the child who is starting to uh, completely lose it, as we say. Okay? So, this is how not to do it. This is how it sounds when you do it right. Por favor, ven a ayudarme a recoger la caca de perro en el patio. Siempre recojo la caca, etc. ¿Quieres recoger o sostener la bolsa? Okay, change the subject. Don't respond to the argument. ¿Por qué tengo que hacerlo? He's not going to fall for it right away, right? Okay. Vamos a hacerlo para que pueda darte tu estrella por la tarde. Now, this is a good example of a parent using a behavior plan to help move the child along. This is how you use behavior plans. Uh, it's not just a chart on the wall. All right, I admit that the child may still uh, be somewhat unclear, stays upbeat, and ignores the child's protestations. How can you argue with this? All right, he cannot argue with this. And so he gets up. He's much more likely to give up soon, all right? One of the reasons, another reason you don't uh, argue with people with Prader-Willi syndrome, you'll know this is true as soon as I say it. They are not limited by the facts, and they are not limited by the logic. Right? They don't need facts, they don't use facts, and they don't use logic, especially when they are upset. Okay? Alright, I don't know why that's there. Alright, um, the next... Uh, skill to have is, um, I've, I've referenced this, or, 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 or it's come up already in my examples, but it's low attention to the wrong behavior or to, or to negative behaviors, all right? So I've already told you, don't comment on the non-compliance, all right? Don't comment on the argument. Now, this topic one of the problems is that parents are often told by psychologists and other behavioral people, oh, just ignore the behavior, okay? Well, I'm sorry, that's not enough information, all right? You have to tell the parent what to do while they are ignoring the behavior. And I'm just giving you some examples of that, all right? So people have a tendency also to blame all negative behaviors on attention seeking, seeking attention. Um, I want to say something about Prader-Willi syndrome. It is true that they do have attention-seeking behaviors, but most of these behaviors do not begin as attention-seeking, but um, they are reinforced very, very strongly by attention. Okay, 
So I made an illustration. I hope it's not too. Um, yeah, there's the kid with the sweater. You know, everything, everything. Okay. So if you look at this, uh, just graphic. Start at the top, and if you have an unexpected stimulus, which actually shocks or disappoints uh, the child, something. There's a disappointment. There's some uncertainty. There's a change in plans, and there's a stress reaction. And this stress reaction is what comes out as yelling, crying, tantruming in some form or another, okay? That happens so fast, right? There's almost nothing you can do to stop it. It's just going to happen. However, how you respond will either reinforce it, ah, It's hard to believe I played the piano, but I can't even break this thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, if your response reinforces the behavior, you are going to get more of the behavior, and it becomes a vicious cycle. If your response is low-key, calm, you will not reinforce the behavior. It won't necessarily stop it cold. The child will need time to calm down, but again, at least you are not uh, you are not um, escalating him, causing him to escalate with your escalation. Okay. So, um, people often say, but I can't let him get away with it. Alright? So, um, let's look at some of the ways that you can respond or things you can do while these behaviors are going on. Um, if they are simply being non compliant or um, Arguing, uh, lack of respect, bad language, um, crying. You don't have to say anything about the behavior and just tell them what it is you want them to do. Say nothing about what you don't want them to do. Tell them what you want them to do. And you keep repeating it. I think we should go up to your room to help you calm down. I think we should go up to your room to help you calm down. And it keeps going, but you are not escalating. Okay. Some kids, you can say, "What can I do to help you calm down?" All right. So you can, but important is that you um, don't make comments on that actual behavior. One of the problems is that when you start talking about the child's bad behavior, remember I said they can't process two things at once. If you're talking about the bad behavior, all they can do is think about the bad behavior. If you're talking about what you want them to do, they are much more likely to be able to focus on that and do it. Okay? Now, sometimes things get into destruction of property, verbal aggression, or even physical aggression. Okay? Especially parents will overreact when the physical aggression is toward a younger child. Well, this is very common in all kinds of kids. Um, and you, um, and again, it, no point in commenting. Uh, on the behavior, but move in and use your body to disrupt the negative behavior. Okay, just use your body. Um, you, that doesn't mean that you will get aggressive with the child, rather you get between the child and whatever he's trying to destroy or injure. And this is the complaint um, from sometimes by from just people, onlookers or standards, you can't let them get away with that, okay? Well, you can ignore the behavior. It doesn't mean you're ignoring the child, all right? So, um, when, now I am gonna take a couple of comments about um, sibling issues. If your kids, if you've got two kids, especially two little boys close in age, uh, who are spending most of the time with mama. Mama is their heart, okay? Mama is their love. Um, and they are competing intensely for mama, all right? When they are um, taking a toy from another child or yelling at another child or even hitting another child, mama feels she has to run in, figure out who's started it, okay? And, and then announce who's getting a punishment and so forth. That reinforces the fighting. Okay, so in a residential facility, uh, the people with Potter Willie syndrome, when they are living together, get intensely competitive. 
and they will compete for approval or, or try to get each other into trouble. Siblings will try to get each other into trouble. Okay? Then you just separate them as quietly and non, non, uh, without giving any indication as to who you think is responsible. No indication, just, hey, you come with me, I want to show you something. Do you want to finish watching your television show? And you come with me, okay? So one, one thing at a time. Then later, if you think it's useful, in private, you talk to each child. So, what happened in the kitchen this morning, okay? Yeah, when you were fighting with, or when you and Bobby were yelling. Okay, you don't give any indication. Let the child empty his heart and tell you how it's the other kid's fault. All right? Just listen to him. And they will both tell you it's the other one's fault. And neither one is lying because they both truly think it's the other one's fault. All right? They don't remember what they did, but they sure remember what the other one did. Okay? And then you give the same answer every time. Oh, I'm so sorry he did that to you. Is there anything you could have done besides kicking him in the stomach? Okay. And then, if the child is able, you do some problem solving. This might be your typical child. Now, by and large, the child of Prada Willie syndrome, it's almost not worthwhile having this conversation. You let him tell how bad it was. You can try that. But most of the time, if you say, do you want to talk about what happened in the kitchen? Most of the time, after a little while, and after you've done this for a while, and the children realize they are not going to be able to get each other into trouble, okay? They are never going to see you scold the other child. They are much less interested in these confrontations, or much less. I'm not saying they're going to go away, but I, I've done this with lots of families, and they, they do uh, diminish. Also, be careful. Um, the child with Prader Willis syndrome is very reactive. So a younger sibling, usually, an older sibling will just ignore it and stay clear most of the time. But a younger sibling will often feel empowered by being able to, to provoke the kid with Prader Willis syndrome and then, you know, feel feel very powerful and mom loves me best and, and lots of things that reinforce that behavior. And so this little scenario, if you do this little dance with your kids, uh, you, you, will, you will eliminate that reward for provoking his brother. Because remember, they're very sly at doing it, okay? They can do it with just a look or a little word or a tone, and then the proud or really child is screaming, and it's very easy to come running in and blame the proud or really child. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so another comment about sibling issues. A child with Prader Willi syndrome, it's possible that he will, over time, uh, teach your other children to be flexible, generous, and loving. However, he can also teach your other children uh, to be resentful. Okay, so one of the tools I use for siblings of children with disabilities and behavior problems is the flex card. And I tell the parents to make a number of these brightly colored cards, get them laminated with plastic. You might want half a dozen or so. And whenever your typical child has to make a concession or give something up because of your Prada Willi child, you quietly slip him a flex card. Or you might even just have to say, you just learned a flex card, okay? Later on, that child can cash in the flex card, uh, return the flex card for some opportunity or privilege, and this is all on the quiet side of things. Um, and this, probably most important, is just the existence of the flex card, not even the reward. That is, as the children get older, they are just appreciate being appreciated. Okay. The next topic uh, is distraction and redirection. Um, again, I've more or less illustrated this, but distraction is a wonderful tool. Just something completely off the wall, something completely non-contextual would be the uh, uh, technical term for it. That can be effective. 
or just say, hey, let's let's play this game, let's do that. It's it's much easier to move them on um, using that technique. Redirection is again is the word for when you're telling them what you want them to do and you are not talking about what you don't want them to do. This takes focus, this takes concentration. And you can download my handout and then all of this is there. Okay? <coughs> Um, these are some things that you don't want to do. So the child is playing with the cat instead of working. And you say, leave the cat alone. And the child says, I wasn't touching the cat. All right? And um, the child and the parent says, yes, you were. You never listen. You're always bothering the cat. All right? Immediately you can see the mistakes that this parent is making. Parent is talking about what he doesn't want the child to do. He's still talking about bothering the cat. All right. Also, the parent is arguing with the child on the on the facts of the matter. Yes, you are touching the cat. Okay. And the father is speaking again of the behavior that. Um, oh, and then the father brings up, or the parent brings up. Um, behavior in the past. This is a waste of time and very counterproductive. So um, the, ch the child has something to argue with. Um, for every point that the parent makes, the child will make another point that is perfectly ridiculous, but the argument keeps going. And he continues playing with the cat. So you just pick up the cat and say, come on, I want to show your work to daddy. All right, so what's this parent doing? This parent is talking about what he wants the child to do, not what he is doing. He continues to focus on what he wants to do, even after the child um, argues. Also, everything the parent says is positive and optimistic. And finally, the parent is using actions and not just words. And this is very, very effective. Okay. All right, the last one, no, not the last one, almost the last one, um, is uh, how to talk about plans of uh, intervention for uh, behavior, uh, behavior plans. Now, um, there's a whole different lecture uh, on behavior plans. I'm not going into how to structure them, but many of them fail because people don't know how to use them when there are problem behaviors. And the way we use them is to talk optimistically about what the child is working for and what he can earn. Now, um, the, there is a handout, a detailed handout on behavior plans in Spanish on my website. Okay? I think the Chilenos uh, uh, translated it for me. Okay, a behavior plan makes a huge, huge difference, and it doesn't have to be terribly complicated. But a behavior plan can turn the parent into the punisher or the scolder, and put the parent on the child's side as a cheerleader. Okay, the parent is saying, let's make sure you earn your stars today. You can earn, um, and I will help you by only making positive comments. The parent isn't really saying that, but that's, that's the effect. At the same time, the child is saying, uh, I do better when I am thinking of happy things and which uh, change the chemicals in my brain and make me um, uh, less reactive. And that is a fact, okay? Remember, I don't know, the story of Peter Pan? They say, think happy thoughts. It really does change the chemicals in your brain. So you can help the child by making happy comments. And that's what a behavior plan can do for you. Okay? The Pride of Willy kids really respond well to behavior plans if you, if you design them correctly. Better than just about any other children I know. Because they, their brains are re wired for reward. They are, all of our brains are wired for reward, but they are very, very motivated by reward. Aren't they constantly talking about the next great thing? What they want, what they want you to do, what they want you to buy them, what they want to eat? 
Okay? So they're constantly talking about things that are rewarding. Listen to them, and you'll see what I mean. Okay. Now the last section is the tour de force, is the, um, is the art of de-escalation. And it's a tour de force because during a tantrum, I'm going to talk about what I want you to do, uh, what I want you to do through, during an outburst or a tantrum, um, because you are going to use all of these skills uh, that I've just talked about. The art of de-escalation. These um, events I call, uh, we have lots of names for them in the U.S., you have a number of names for them. Uh, in a way, they are adrenaline storms, okay? Um, the child appears overwhelmed or furious. It's the same hormone, okay? So the little girl on the, on the top, you can see that she is overwhelmed. And you are much less likely to respond to her with anger, okay? But I can tell you that the little girl on the bottom is having the same experience. It's just coming out as anger. And we have to respond in the same manner, independence of the appearance of their emotions. All right. So there's kind of a theoretical anatomy of the tantrum. Uh, there is an escalation, which may be very short and almost instantaneous. There is a peak, and then there is some time when there is a little, when there is some de-escalation, or they are no longer at their peak, they're starting to calm. Okay? The shape of the tantrum uh, can be anything, but I, so I just wanted you to see these different curves. And you may notice that your child has very typical pattern, okay, um, in how they in how they deal with stress. So This handout in color is on my website as well. Okay, so um, there are some things you should always do. There are some things that you should never do at any time during the tantrum. And there are some things that will work, but not at the peak of the tantrum. There's just nothing, really, very little you can do that's going to help at the peak, but you can certainly make things worse. So that's those are the things that you never do. Okay, let's talk about always, never sometimes. Always uh, stay in the moment and don't talk in the immediate future, that is what's coming next, not the distant future. Don't say things like, you'll never have friends if you don't do this. Okay? Not, not a useful statement. All right? um, to say the least possible. Uh, use a calm voice, low expressed emotion, and um, act disinterested not concerned, but not worried, not intense. In other words, you're, you're focused on the child. Sometimes you have to turn your focus to something else, but um, you, you, do not, um, you do not invest a lot of yourself into needing to stop this tantrum. If I come to your house and your child is having a tantrum, I cannot stop that tantrum any faster than you can, okay? Because you can't stop a freight train, all right? You, you, but you can make it a lot worse, and that's what I'm trying to teach you not to do. Okay, what you never do, you never give in on account of a tantrum. You don't bribe, you don't argue. Uh, don't try to reason. Um, make threats. Uh, talk about the distant past, like you always, you never listen to me. You always play a bother the cat. That's distant, that's past, talking about the past. Um, Say how desperate you are. This is tough because sometimes you are desperate. Please put your clothes on. We've got to leave the store. Okay? So, um, but in fact, that will tend to uh, augment the behavior. No talking um, around what he's doing and how much he is inconveniencing you and other people. That is a completely fruitless comment in my experience. All right? Um, and try not to show um, shock or um, uh, shock or, or anger. Okay, if you, can, you may you'll have to fake it. Okay, it's, this is an act. All right, you all get an Oscar. <laughs> okay. Sometimes you can start using your voice to calm the child. This is when the child is starting is less at the peak. Okay, most of the time when they're at their peak, 
what you say only irritates them. But if they're starting to calm, sometimes you can say things to help them calm. You can redirect, you can distract, and you can remind them of the next cool thing that you're going to do that day, or how they um, uh, can start working for something else that they're interested in, like the reward, okay? If the child has, for some reason, depending on his behavior plan, lost some reward, now is not the time to discuss it. That comes later. Gracias.